Haunted, Tales of the Supernatural. Tony Britton and Jack May star in The Grey Ones by J.B. Priestley. Dramatised for radio by Patricia Mays. And your occupation, Mr. Patson? I'm uh, an exporter. It's a family business. My grandfather started it. Originally for the Far East. Firms abroad, especially in rather remote places, send us orders for all manner of goods, which we buy here on commission for them. It's not the business it was 50 years ago, of course. Still, I enjoy it. That is the impression you've given me. And you're reasonably prosperous, I gather. We all have our financial worries these days, of course. <laughs> I know I have. <laughs> so I think we can eliminate all that side, eh, Mr Patson? Oh, yes, certainly. Hmm. Well, now, tell me what's troubling you. Well, Mr Patson? Before I can tell the whole story, can I ask you a question? If you think it might help? Yes, I think it could. Because I'd like to know roughly where you stand before I begin to explain. Dr. Smith, do you believe there is a kind of evil principle in the universe? A sort of super devil that's working hard to ruin humanity and has its agents who must really be minor devils or demons living among us as people? Do you believe that? Certainly not. That's merely superstitious fancy for which there is no scientific evidence whatsoever. It's easy to understand, although we needn't go into that now, why anybody, even today, suffering from emotional stress might be possessed by such an absurd belief. It's, it's mere fantasy, entirely subjective in origin. And the notion that this evil principle could have its agents among us might be very dangerous indeed. It could produce serious antisocial effects. You realise that, Mr Patson? Oh, yes, I do. I mean, at certain times, when, when, well, when I've been able to look at it as you're looking at it, Doctor... But most times I can't. <laughs> and that, I suppose, is why I'm here. <laughs> Quite so. And I think you've been well advised to come here and seek psychiatric treatment. These things are apt to be sharply progressive, although their actual progress might be described as regressive. <laughs> but I won't worry you with technicalities, Mr Patson. I'll merely say that you, or, or was it Mrs Patson, or, shall I say, both of you, are to be congratulated on taking this very sensible step in good time. And now you know, as you said, where I stand. Perhaps you'd better tell me all about it. Please don't omit anything for fear of appearing ridiculous. I can only help you if you are perfectly frank with me, Mr Patson. I may ask you a few questions, but their purpose will be to make your account clearer to me. Oh, by the way, here we don't adopt the psychoanalytic methods. We don't sit behind our patients while they relax on a couch. But if you would find it easier not to address me as you have been doing face to face... Oh, no, no, that's all right. I think I can talk to you just like this. Anyhow, I'll try. Ah, good. And remember, try to tell me everything relevant. Uh. Smoke, if it will help you to concentrate. Oh, thanks. I might, later on. <clears throat> well, it, it began about a year ago. I have a cousin who's a publisher... And one night he took me to dine at his club, the Burlington. Well, uh, after dinner we played bridge for an hour or two and then we went down to the lounge for a final drink before leaving. And it was then that I overheard Furbright, you know, the, the famous painter... Oh, yeah. ..who was obviously full of drink, although you couldn't exactly call him drunk, and was holding forth to a little group at the other side of the fireplace. Apparently, he'd just come back from Syria or somewhere around there and he'd picked this idea up from somebody there, though he said it only confirmed what he'd been thinking himself for some time. You mean the idea of an evil principle working to ruin humanity? Yes. Furbright said that the old notions of a scarlet and black sulfuric Satan busy tempting people was, of course, all wrong, though it might have been right at one time, perhaps in the Middle Ages. Then the devils were all fire and energy. Furbright quoted the poet Blake, I've read him since, to show that these weren't real devils and their hell wasn't the real hell. Blake, in fact, according to Furbright, was the first man to suggest 
that we didn't understand the evil principle. But in his time, he hardly made a start. It's during the last few years, Furbright said, that the horrible thing has really got to work on us. Got to work on us? Doing what? Destroying the soul of humanity. To eliminate certain states of mind that belong essentially to the good. To wipe from the face of the earth all wonder, joy, deep feeling, the desire to create, to praise life. Mind you, that, that's what Furbright said. But you believed him. I couldn't help feeling even then that there was something in it. I'd, I'd never thought on those lines before. I'm, I'm just a plain businessman and not given to fancy speculation. But I had been feeling for some time that things were going wrong. And that somehow they seemed to be out of our control. In theory, I suppose we're responsible for the sort of lives we lead. But in actual practice, we find ourselves living more and more the kind of life we don't like. It's as if we were all compelled to send our washing to one huge, sinister laundry, which returned everything with more and more colour bleached out of it until it was all a dismal grey. I take it that you are now telling me what you thought and felt yourself, and not what you overheard this man Furbright About say. the laundry, about the laundry, yes, and, and, and about things never going the right way, yes. That's what I'd been feeling. As if the shape and colour and smell of things were going. Do you understand what I mean, Doctor? Oh, yes, it's part of a familiar pattern. Your age may have something to do with it. Oh, I, I, don't, I don't think so. This is something quite different. I've made allowances for that. Mm. So far as you can, no doubt. And, of course, that wasn't all, by any means. Now we come to these agents. Ah, yes, the agents. It was Furbright who gave you that idea, was it? Yes, it, it would never have occurred to me, I'll admit. But... If this evil principle was trying to make something like insects out of us, it could do it two ways. One, by a sort of remote control. Perhaps by a sort of continuous radio programme, never leaving our minds alone. Telling us not to attempt anything new, to play safe, not to have any illusions, to keep to routine. But the other way, direct control, you might call it, was by the use of these agents, a sort of evil fifth column, with more and more of them everywhere, hard at work. Devils? Demons? What? Well, that's what they amount to, except that it gives one a wrong idea of them, horns and tails and that sort of thing. These are quite different, Furbright says. All you can definitely say is that they're not human. They don't belong to us. They don't like us. They're working against us. They have their orders. They know what they're doing. They work together in teams. They arrange to get jobs for one another, more and more influence and power. So, what chance have we against them? If such beings existed, we should soon be at their mercy, I agree. Aye. But then they don't exist. Except, of course, as figures of fantasy. Although in that capacity they can do a great deal of harm. I take it, Mr. Patson, that you have thought about, or shall we say, brooded over these demonic creatures rather a lot lately. Oh, yes. I must say I have. Quite so. Uh, by the way, what do you call them? It might save time and possible confusion if we can give them a name. They're the grey ones. Ah, the grey ones. You seem very sure about this, Mr. Patson. Well, why shouldn't I be? You ask me what I call them, so I tell you. Of course, I don't know what they call themselves, and I didn't invent that name for them. Oh, this is Furbright again, is it? Yes, yes, that's what I heard him calling them. And it seemed to me a very good name for them. They're trying to give everything a grey look, aren't they? Just quiet grey fellows, busy greying everything. That's them. Mm, is it indeed? Aye. Yet you've never met one. Isn't that highly suggestive? Doesn't that make you ask yourself what truth there can be in this absurd notion? All these grey ones seeking power over us, influencing our lives, and yet you've never actually come into contact with one? Now, now, Mr. Patterson... Who says I've never met one? Where did you get that idea from, Doctor? Oh, do you mean to tell me? Certainly I mean to tell you. I know at least a dozen of them. 
My own brother-in-law is one. So that's how it is, Mr. Patson. Very well. Let us begin with your brother-in-law. When and how did you make the discovery that he is a grey one? Well, I'd wondered about Harold for years. I've always disliked him, but I never quite knew why. He puzzled me, too. He's one of those chaps who don't seem to have any centre you can understand. They don't... They don't act from any ordinary human feeling. They haven't motives you can appreciate. It's as if there was nothing inside them. They seem to tick over like automatic machines. I'd try to get closer to him, just for my wife's sake, although they'd never been close. I'd talk to him at home after dinner, and sometimes I'd take him out. You couldn't call him unfriendly. That at least would have been something. He'd listen up to a point while I talked. If I asked him a question, he'd make some sort of reply. He'd talk himself in a kind of fashion. Rather like a leading article in one of the more cautious newspapers. Chilly stuff, grey stuff. Nothing exactly wrong with it, but nothing right about it either. And after a time, about half an hour or so, I'd find it hard to talk to him, even about my own affairs. I'd begin wondering what to say next. There'd be a sort of vacuum between us. He had a trick, which I've often met elsewhere of deliberately not encouraging you to go on, of just staring, waiting for you to say something silly. Now, I put this down to his being a public official. When I first knew him, he was one of the assistants to the clerk of our local borough council. Now he's the clerk. Quite a good job for ours as a big borough. Well, a man in that position has to be more careful than somebody like me, as he can't let himself go, he's got too many people to please, or rather not to offend. And one thing was certain about Harold. And that ought to have made him more human, but somehow it didn't. And that was that he meant to get on. He had ambition. With a bit of fire and nonsense in it somewhere, but a sort of cold determination to keep on moving up. You see what I mean? No questions, remember, Mr Patson. Oh, I forgot, I'm sorry. Well, that's how he is. But then... I noticed another thing about Harold, and even my wife had to agree about this. He was what we called a damper. If you took him out to enjoy something, he not only didn't enjoy it himself, but he contrived somehow to stop you enjoying it too. Then, before I'd learnt some sense, I'd talk to him about various plans I had for improving the business, but as soon as I'd described any scheme to Harold, I could feel my enthusiasm ebbing away. I felt, or he made me feel, any possible development wasn't worth the risk. Better stick to the old routine. Well, I think I'd have been done for now if I hadn't had sense enough to stop talking to Harold about the business. If he asked me about any new plans, I'd tell him I hadn't any. Now, all this was long before I knew about the Grey Ones. But I had Harold on my mind, particularly as he lived and worked so close to us. When he became clerk of the council, I began to take more interest in our municipal affairs, just to see what influence Harold was having on them. I made almost a detective job of it. Between them, he and his friend, the treasurer, who was another of them, managed to put an end to everything that added a little colour and sparkle to life around our way. Of course, they always had a good excuse, economy, you know, and all that. But I noticed that Harold and the treasurer only made economies in one direction, what you might call the anti-grey side. They never stirred themselves to save money in other directions. When did you decide Harold was a grey one? As soon as I began thinking over what Furbright said. I'd never been able to explain Harold before, and God knows I've tried often enough. And then I saw at once he was a grey one. He wasn't born one, of course, for that couldn't possibly be how it works. My guess is that sometime while he was still young... The soul or essence of the real Harold Southers was drawn out and a grey one slipped in. That must be going on all the time now. There are so many of them about. Of course, they recognise each other and help each other. That makes it easy for them to handle us humans. They know exactly what they're up to. They receive and give orders. It's like having a whole, well-disciplined, secret army working against us. 
and the only possible chance now is to bring them out into the open and declare war on them. How can we do that if they're secret? Oh, I've thought a lot about that. And it's not so completely hopeless as you might think. After a time, you begin to recognise a few. Harold, for instance, and our borough treasurer. Yes, I know what you're thinking, Doctor. If they're all officials, eh? Well, no, they aren't. Though seven or eight of them are, and you can see why. Because that's where the power is now. Another two are up-and-coming politicians, and not in the same party, either. One's a banker, I know, in the city, and he's a grey one, all right. I wouldn't have been able to spot them if I hadn't spent so much time either with Harold or wondering about him. They all have the same... Oh, cutting down and bleaching stare. The same dead touch. <sighs> Wait till you see a whole lot of them together holding a conference. Perhaps you would like a cigarette now, Mr Patson. Eh? No, uh, take one of these. Uh, I'm not a smoker myself, but I'm told they're excellent. Oh. Ah, you. you will have a light. Good. Aye. Now, take it easy for a minute or two, because I think you're tiring a little. And it's very important you should be able to finish your account of these grey ones. If possible, without any hysterical overemphasis. Uh, no, 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 Mr. Patson. I didn't mean to suggest there'd been any overemphasis so far. You've done very well indeed up to now, bearing in mind the circumstances. <laughs> it's a heavy sort of day, isn't it? Oh, we seem to have too many days like this, don't we? Aye. Or is it simply that we're not getting any younger? <laughs> now then, Mr. Patson, at the point you broke off your story, shall we call it, you had suggested that you had seen a whole lot of grey ones together holding a conference. I think you might very usefully enlarge that rather astonishing suggestion, don't you? Yeah, I'd just as soon leave that, if you don't mind, Doctor. Unless you are perfectly frank with me, it'll be very difficult for me to help you. Come now, we agreed about that. So far, you follow my instructions admirably. All I ask now is for a little more cooperation. Did you actually attend what you believe to be a conference of these grey ones? Yes, I did. But I'll admit I can't prove anything. I overheard Harold and our borough treasurer arranging to travel together to Mornby Hall. It's about 15 miles north of where I live. I'd never been there myself, but I'd heard of it in connection with various summer schools and conferences and that sort of thing. Perhaps you know it, Dr Smith. As a matter of fact, I do. I had to give a paper there one Saturday night. Well, it seems they were going there to attend a conference of the New Era Community Planning Association. And when I heard them saying that, first I told myself how lucky I was not to be going too. Then, afterwards, thinking it over, I saw that if you wanted to hold a meeting that no outsider in his senses would want to attend, you couldn't do better than to hold it in a country house that's not too easy to get at and call it a meeting or a conference of the New Era Community Planning Association. Well, Saturday was the day of the conference. I went down to my office in the morning just to go through the post and see if there's anything urgent and they went home to lunch. In the middle of the afternoon, I felt I had to know what was happening out at Mornby Hall. So off I went in my car. I parked it just outside the grounds, uh, sorted round a bit, and then I found an entrance through a little wood at the back. There were nobody about, and I sneaked into the house by way of a servant's door near the pantries and larders. There were some catering people around there, but nobody bothered me. I went up some back stairs and after a bit more scouting which I enjoyed as much as anything I've done this year I was guided by the sound of voices to a small door in a corridor upstairs it led to a little balcony overlooking the floor of the ballroom there was no window near this balcony so it was rather dark up there and I was able to creep down to the front rail without being seen there must have been between three and four hundred of them in that ballroom, sitting on little chairs. This balcony was high above the platform, so I had a pretty good view of them as they sat facing it. They looked like grey ones, but of course I couldn't be sure. And for the first hour or so, I couldn't be sure whether this really was a meeting of the New Era Community Planning Association or a secret conference of the grey ones. The stuff they talk would have done for either. 
That's where the grey ones are so damnably clever. They've only to carry on doing what everybody expects them to do in their capacity as sound, conscientious citizens and men in authority to keep going with their own hellish task. Well, I was just about to creep back up to the corridor. Giving it up was a bad job. When something happened... Yes, Mr. Patson, then something happened. Well, this is the part you can say I imagined. And I can't prove that I didn't. But I certainly didn't dream it because I was far too cramped and aching to fall asleep. Well, the first thing I noticed was a sudden change in the atmosphere of the meeting. It, it, it was as if somebody very important had arrived although I didn't see anybody arriving. And I got the impression that the real meeting was about to begin. These grey ones, massed together down there, had now a positive quality of their own, which I'd never discovered before. It wasn't that they were just negative, not human, as they were at ordinary times. They had this positive quality, which, which I can't describe except as a sort of chilly hellishness as if they'd stopped pretending to be human and were letting themselves go, recovering their demon natures. I was crouching there, just above three or four hundred creatures from cold, cold hell. That quality I mentioned, that chilly hellishness, it seemed to come rolling over me in waves I might have been kneeling on the edge of a pit of iniquity a million miles deep. I felt the force of this hellishness, not on the outside, but inside, as if the very essence of me was being challenged and attacked. Then somebody, something, arrived. Whoever or whatever they'd been waiting for was down there on the platform. I knew that definitely, but I couldn't, I couldn't see him or it. All I could make out was a sort of thickening and whirling of the air down there. Then out of that a voice spoke. The voice of the leader they'd been expecting. But this voice didn't come from outside through my ears. It spoke inside me, right in the centre, so that it came out to my attention, if, if you see what I mean. All I wanted to do was to get away from there as soon as I could. But for a few minutes I was too frightened to make the necessary move. Then you heard what this voice was saying, Mr. Pat. Some of it, yes. Excellent. Now, this is important. Did you learn from it anything you hadn't known before? Please answer me carefully. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you one thing you won't believe. Not about the voice, we'll come to that. But about those grey ones. I risked a peep while the voice was talking. And what I saw nearly made me pass out. There they were, three or four hundred of them, not looking human at all, not making any attempt. They'd all gone back to their original shapes. They looked, this is the nearest I can get to it, like big semi-transparent toads. And their eyes were like 600 electric lamps burning underwater, all greeny, unblinking, and shining out of hell. But what did you hear the voice say? How much can you remember? That's what I want to know. Come along, man. I, I heard it thank them. In the name of Adaragrapha, Lord of the Creeping Hosts. Oh, yes, I could have imagined it. Only I never knew I'd got that sort of imagination. And what is imagination, anyhow? What else? What else did you hear? Ten thousand more were to be drafted into the western region. There'd be promotion for some who'd been on continuous duty longest. Grey ones. And more and more of them coming, taking charge of us, giving us a push here, a shove there, down, down, 
down. Mr. Patson, Mr. Patson, you must not excite yourself so much. I cannot allow it. <laughs> and now I must ask you to keep still and quiet for a minute while I speak to my partner, Dr. Meinstein. It's for your own good. Now give me your promise. All right. Well, don't be long. Oh, Dr. Smith, I was just... Your clock has stopped. These two gentlemen are my colleagues, Mr. Patson, Dr. Meinstein and Dr. Stobart. You must realise that you are a very sick man. Sick in mind, if not yet sick in body. Uh -huh. So you must put yourself in our hands. Oh! oh. oh. Oh, God! No! Keep away! Ravens! You! Ravens! That was The Grey Ones by J.B. Priestley, with Tony Britton as Patson and Jack May as Dr. Smith. Dramatised for radio by Patricia Mays. It's a World Service Drama production produced by Derek Hodenot and directed by Martin Williamson.